I'm on that. Audio is coming through. I'm going to switch to use me the most, and hopefully in a second, it will come up. What the hell? Okay, I got caught on a... The problem with these wireless mics is sometimes you get caught on things. Yeah, that's going to be in the blooper reel. All right, I'm, I'm basically in frame if I walk from like here to here. I'm going to stay mostly here. Hi, folks. Unfortunately, Tom could not make it, so I'm giving a semi... Uh, impromptu speech on a uh, lock picking and bypass. So it's not the one you expected. Sorry. Feel free to leave if you um, have no interest in the subject matter. But hopefully I can be somewhat educational on the generalities of how most modern locks you're going to encounter around here at work. First of all, a little bit about me. My name is Aiden Crenshaw and I'm on irongeek.com. I have an interest, uh, interest in infosec education. Don't know everything. I'm just a geek with time on my hands. Probably will get some things wrong. So if we feel, feel free to tell me if I do. Um, also, I'm a senior information security consultant for TrustedSec and a co-founder of DerbyCon. Now, for this talk, there's several people I want to thank, and I need to modify this slide to add some more now that I think about it. Doss Mann from Bloomington Fools, that's a lockpick organization in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, he's kind of my mentor when it comes to lockpicking. De uh, Deviant Olaf, don't ask me why it's pronounced Olaf, it is. Um, he's a guru in lockpicking as well. Wrote a really good book called uh, uh, Practical Lock Picking. That if you're interested in the subject, check it out. Shane Lawson was his technical editor on that book. He does a lot of work on, um, well, great lock picker. Did a lot of work on decoding, I believe it was Schlage's um, rekeyable system a couple years back. And Doug uh, Hyrella and uh, Jeff Moss, they're out of Cleveland Lock Sport. And they have their own little channels. Uh, I believe that one is Doug's. He shows you how to make some homemade lock picks. First, what is lock picking? Basically, lock picking is using imperfections in a lock and your understanding of how it works so you can actually bypass it without using the correct key. But technically, we can make some, um, some distinctions between picking and bypass. Picking usually involves direct directly manipulating the pins in a lock or the wafers or um, the disc tumblers. And bypass, usually you're using some other mechanism besides what the key would interact with directly to be able to unlock it. Um, generally, people may ask, um, isn't this kind of sketchy ethically to teach people this? But your average criminal is going to be uh, probably breaking in through a window or something like that. Um, it's a lot easier. Lock picking from a pen tester standpoint, well, if you can get in and uh, open a server room and take out the server, you don't need to attack it from across the network if all you want is the data. Laws also vary from state to state. I'm not quite sure what's going on in West Virginia. I'll have to look into that. But most states are uh, what's known as uh, they have to show intent for possession of picks to be considered an extra charge of burglary tools. And I'll cover a little bit more of that in a second. Also, another thing that's of interest for people who um, want to pick locks, you want to know whether or not your front door lock is any good. My personal front door locks, and some people ask me this question, it's just a cheapy quick set because I have windows. I have windows right next to my door lock. So if someone really wants, smash, grab, reach through, grab the latch, turn it, and come on in. Okay, lock bypass. A little bit different. Usually doesn't involve um, manipulating the keys. There's all sorts of um, subgroups in bypass. I mean, shimming, where you're trying to push aside the latching mechanism. Shiving, where you might be reaching inside the lock to try to pull aside locking dogs, which I'll try to explain in a bit. Uh, bypass drivers. Loiding, which is, get this name from uh, celluloid, for basically going through a door and uh, hitting the latch and pulling it aside. Um, you, you've seen the deadlocking latches that close and lock behind you? The way those are supposed to be hung, on the modern ones, there's a little button that's supposed to be slightly depressed when it goes in. Most people don't hang them right. That doesn't get pushed in. So you can load the lock or use a credit card to get in through many of them. Um, even if it's on the other side of the jam, there's like these special, very tough plastic films you can buy to reach in through and get past uh, the molding and actually open the lock. I've even got past, uh, there's something called, I think it's referred to as jam armor by some people, where they put a special metal plate there to keep you from being able to get, do that. With something this long, I've been able to get around that before and still get into the lock. Or through the door, I should say. And also slim gems for like autos and so forth. Now, the question might be asked is, is this legal or not? Uh, possession of the lock picks kind of varies from state to state. Um, on here, pretty much if it's one of the uh, Regular green, pixel legal by statute, 
state must prove criminal intent. So usually what this ends up being is an extra charge if you're caught with burglary tools. Uh, but possession in and of themselves is not necessarily illegal. So basically if you're caught breaking in some place and you have lockpicks, it's probably going to be an extra charge tacked on. But just possession itself, not so bad. Uh, the ones that are kind of the bluish green, which may not be really reading well on the screen, those are uh, picks are legal due to lack of any statute whatsoever. The Barry Tool is the one who actually researched all this information. I think they spent like $5,000 on lawyers to, to look at different state laws to figure out what they were. Though some things may have changed. I'm not sure how many years ago this was. Uh, most of the, uh, now the really light green states, picks are legal, but uh, other related laws should be noted. Like those various states where you can have lock picks, but you can't transfer them, sell them. And I've been told recently in California you can sell them, but you have to take name and address and all this other information about them. Uh, the one state in the union that's really anal retentive about it is Tennessee. By direct statute, there's a few other exemptions, but um, you pretty much have to be a locksmith to have them. But they're not so much worried about burglary as they are unlicensed locksmiths. It seems to be more of a protectionist thing for locksmiths in Tennessee than an anti-burglary thing. And uh, I've been told various things about Virginia, but those various states where it's a prima facie, where they basically you have to prove a good reason why you have them. Otherwise, it's shown, it's seen as intent that you plan to commit a crime. Is that more or less the way Virginia works? Okay. Now, as far as where to take them, people get a little surprised by this, but one of my pastimes when I'm on a plane is the lock pick. So I've never had a problem. My picks get on, no, pro no problems whatsoever. They may look at the case and go, okay, and put it back in. Uh, the main things I've ever gotten confiscated for me, well, technically, they said I could go back and check it, but that would cost too much. The only things I've really gotten taken away from me are <sighs> wire strippers and soldering irons. The soldering iron I can halfway see, the wire strippers, which he referred to as a wrench, I'm not sure what I'd do with that. I suppose I could, like, threaten to clip someone's finger or something. It, it, I don't know. Anyway, I get on planes all the time with uh, this kind of kit and sit there and uh, pick locks, and people next to me go, oh, are you a professional locksmith? No, criminal. <laughs> and, you know, I sometimes teach people a little bit locks. Most people just wander by and go, okay, and just keep going. Now, your mileage may vary on this. Chris Nickerson actually, uh, I don't think they actually turned the plane around, but some people freaked uh, when they uh, saw him picking locks on a plane, and uh, he got, um, when they landed, got escorted off, and there was some guy, I think the students referred to him as Little Knives, and this one guy beside him wanted to play hero and say, sit down, because everybody was freaking out because he had picks. I've never had that problem. Why teach this? Well, as I alluded to before, Criminals will generally break a window, not pick. You want to know what a good lock is? This will give you a good idea. Uh, it looks cool on physical pen tests. In general, when we break into a place physically, we get in through piggybacking. We follow someone else in after a smoke break. We generally don't have to pick locks. But it does look really cool when they show you the waste bin with all the paper that's supposed to be shredded and go, here's the lock, here's your paper. People think that's kind of cool looking. So, also, I just like locks. I just like the mechanisms, um, the mechanical components. Not fun to play with. Now, Tool has a couple of warnings that uh, that's a big, probably the biggest organization for lock sport in the United States. And also, uh, I think Netherlands is what the European branch is mostly. I'm not, I'm sure someone from there will write me and correct me. But they have a couple of warnings they generally give people about lock picking. Don't pick a lock that does not belong to you or you do not have permission from the rightful owner. And do not pick a lock you rely on. Generally speaking, you can pick a lock a whole lot before it will be um, destroyed and non operable. The only ones I've generally busted are really cheap Chinese ones. These master lock number threes I have all over the place. Um, I have a bunch back there in the kits. Uh, while the bad locks from a standpoint of security, they're actually pretty robust as far as being able to pick them for a long period of time and not have them bust on you. We will cover a little bit about different parts of a lock. We have the shackle I'm referred to, or this is a padlock. The locking lever or pawl or dog, this is basically your tongue and groove piece that um, fits into the shackle itself. Not all locks have this necessarily. Some have ball bearings. In those cases, you can't shim them, which hopefully I'll get a chance to show. You have the cylinder of the lock, actuators or drivers that help move these locking dogs aside, and then just the general body of the lock. I have a few cutaway locks around that you can actually see what's going on. Um, but the basics of how most locks you're going to encounter in America, th this is how they work. Uh, most you're going to count are going to be pin tumbler locks. And a pin tumbler lock works on the, the basis of you have springs, which are up here, driver pins, the one in blue, and key pins. 
Now some people refer to these as top and bottom pins. Since the lock can be hung the opposite way to what we're used to in the United States, it's better to call them key pins, these red ones, and driver pins. Now one of the reasons you can pick a lock is those imperfections. Like this one's exaggerated. By the way, this artwork all came from De Deviant Olive. Uh, these stacks are not completely drilled right. Those imperfections in the pins. This allows you to do things like put a little bit of tension on one and lift the pins up. Try to get just the driver pin above the shear line and you'll be able to turn it. Now sources for uh, lock picks, the ones I usually sell are from Southern Specialties, but um, you can find cheap Chinese sets, uh, mixed results on there. I'm saying a lot of them use really um, crappy, well carbon steel is good for some things, but you end up getting a lot of rusty lock picks, a lot of stuff that's uh, not so great from some of the Chinese manufacturers. So hacker cons, usually you'll find someone like Tool selling them. Uh, most tool organizations I've seen seem to be selling um, the, uh, the ones that come from Southward. Uh, sorry, from some specialties. Southward you can order directly. They have some decent picks. I like them all right. And you can also, uh, sub and specialties directly, some stuff I ordered from. And Sparrows, I like a lot of stuff I've gotten from Sparrows lock picks. They set up at DEF CON every year. Pick types, we have a hook, usually used for single pin lifting. Half diamond, this can be used for raking or um, single pin picking if you want. I sometimes use it on a very small warded lock to be able to pick it. Another useful thing of this, if you want to know how many pins are in a lock, you can take the flat side of this, put it in the lock, pull it across, and count the number of pins falling. The forest offset half diamond, this is probably one of my favorite picks for most um, locks. I rake a lot of locks open with this. This is sometimes called an L rake. I've also seen it referred to as, I think, maybe a city rake. Sadly, I've also seen it referred to as a comb rake, which confuses things because a comb rake is something entirely different. There's also tools like Bogotar uh, or Rave Rakes, and those essentially, um, well, to be a proper Bogotar, it has to be able to be used as a tension tool too. But um, this pattern, this um, free hump pattern, gets you into a whole lot of locks. But to be a proper Bogotar, it would have to be something more along the lines of this, where you can use one as a tension tool while using the other one to pick. So you'd be applying a little bit of tension, and you'd rake in and out with the other one, and hopefully get faint pick in short order. If one doesn't work, switch it around, try the other way, and whether or not I'd be able to do this in a yeah, short amount of time. You can get into a lot of locks with these bow guitars. These were originally uh, designed by a guy named Mobundo. I think he was on the block picking 101 forums, but this particular set is from Sarah Pick. They're made out of some kind of titanium alloy, which is really overkill. It's the titanium thing is more of a it's a G Riz factor. It doesn't really help you any. I actually have a buddy, uh, Ben Hibben. Uh, if you know the Hibben family, they make uh, custom knives and movies and such. He's actually working on making some Bogota lock picks. Or well, some lockpicks in general out of Damascus steel, pattern welded, so you have all that wood grain. I think it's going to be beautiful once you actually get some produced. But, um, yeah, that is some of the basic pick types you're going to see. Uh, some of the ones I sell, I usually have, no, I have, have um, no handle on them directly. That's fine, you can use them that way. But, and I get them that way because they're cheaper and you might want to cut them down. But to improve them, I usually get quarter inch heat shrink tubing and put that on them and put three layers and just heat that, treat, heat that up and shrink it down to the handle and that makes a good comfortable handle. If you use one without a handle for a while, your hand starts getting sore. Plastic dip's good. I've used hot glue to mold my own handles. And uh, some of the lock picks you'll get, especially ones from China, you may want to take some um, sand paper with very fine grit and uh, kind of smooth them off some because they come a little rough at times. One of the most important things is the tension tool. The tension tool is what you use to apply a little bit of tension to the lock, and what you're trying to do is get each one of the, the driver pins to lock up above that shear line on like a little ledge that you've created by applying that little bit of tension. But I mean, you want to create, you want to put very little tension. I actually carry more uh, tension tools than I do anything else. If I was actually show you, let's see. Well, actually, in this set, I may actually have more picks, but I mean, I have various tension tools for different purposes. Because sometimes you just need one that will lock into the lock at just the right spot to be able to get it open. And let me just actually show you uh, a little intro to actually picking a lock. I have a couple of transparent locks here. 
And I tried to explain this a little bit earlier, and I'll have some more illustrations in a second. Actually, you know what? Let's go. I think I have more illustrations in the next one. Oh, as far as sources for tension tools, if you have old wiper blades, windshield wipers, take them apart. You can find some good metal in that for making tensioners. Uh, a buddy of mine makes his sometimes out of um, pop-up hampers. If assuming the spring in it is flat, and uh, street sweeper bristles, if you go looking around on the ground at various places, that's actually what the original bow guitars were made out of, my understanding. Uh, a little tip about picking, this art works for Mary Conley. When you're trying to pick a lock, the key on tension is to be very gentle, at least at first, until you have it picked. Then you might have to put a little extra tension on it to be able to turn, the, depending on how tough the spring is. But uh, my buddy Mick, when he was first being taught how to lock pick, his teacher told him this little um, analogy, which I really like, about how much tension you need to put on, a, on your tension tool. Pretend you have a pet ant, and you dearly love this ant. But this ant has poison all around it, and you don't want Mr. Auntie to walk into the poison because he'll die, but you don't want to put so much pressure on top of the ant's head that you'll crush him. So that's Mick the Ant. Uh, way people practice, a lot of people um, practice on lock towers, like some of the ones I have in the back here. A couple of master lock number threes or number fives for padlocks are nice to practice on. Some people get these progressive sets, like you see right here. Um, well, it's just the cylinder. I suppose if you mount it, it's good for practicing picking door locks, but just holding your hand, it's not really a realistic feel. I have some um, locks back there that have smiley faces on them that are of different complexities. I took padlocks and rekeyed them to have different numbers of pins. So these progressives will have like one pin, two pin, three pin, so you can practice harder and harder locks. There's also these transparent locks. These truthfully are not good for practice. They don't really have the same feedback that a real lock does, but they're really nice for demonstrating how one works. Oh, cheap source of, uh, gun, of locks if you want some to practice on, go to Habitat for Humanity. Also, old locksmiths, uh, sorry, locksmiths will sometimes have ones they can throw out, and sometimes hardware stores will sell old parted out locks. This picture is from my Habitat of Humanity. Info says, sister sent it to me. Uh, you'll find a lot of locks there for like three bucks for the entire door lock, except the key. The key's missing. But for all purposes, not having the key is not a huge problem. All sorts of lock types. I've mostly been talking about pin tumbler locks so far, but there's also warded locks where essentially those pieces of metal keep you from turning like a screwdriver in it and opening the lock. But if you have something that has the right cuts in it, you can turn it, no problem. Uh, pin tumbler locks, which is most of what you're going to see and most of what I've been talking about so far. Wafer locks, where if you look down the keyway, you'll see little flat pieces of metal. You'll find these in a lot of cabinets. Technically, your car might be a wafer lock also. That's a better version of it. They're just very cheap to manufacture. And there's also disc detainer locks, which look like combination locks. But instead of having to turn the dial left and right, left and right, the key itself has angles cut in it that essentially do the same thing. This would be a representation of a warded lock. And um, essentially, you just have pieces of metal in the way that keep you from turning the key or turning any old piece of metal. Uh, let me give you an example of a warded lock. And you can tell this one's a warded lock. You can look down the keyway, and you can see it doesn't have pins. Well, there's a set of five warded picks that will open up most warded locks, you'll see. You just got to figure out which one's which. Now, this is like the cheapest lock you can find at Walmart. You can actually take a key for this particular variety, cut down everything at the very tip, and then use it as a key. But this is essentially, these um, warded picks work like a skeleton key for warded locks. These things are very crappy. Now, this one is the mounting security one from Walmart. Um, the master locks are a little better, but not a lot. Um, the reason people still use water locks some places, though, is they can get gunked up, they can get like dirt in them, and you can still operate them. If they rust up some, you can still operate them. So they're very robust from the standpoint of reliability, but they're not really particularly secure locks. All right, let me see what's next. Yeah, but water locks, I, have, I should have some loan of water picks back there and some water locks if anybody actually wants to try those. Um, this is a set of water picks, which I already showed. Wafer locks. Wafer locks work on these little uh, stamped out wafers that when the right key is put in, it moves the wafers out of the way of the cylinder, and you can turn the cylinder. You'll find these on all sorts of um, cabinets and such. Um, they're very cheap to manufacture. I actually was at a, a, a bank once, and they had a lockbox for all their keys, for higher security locks. But the key for the lockbox was a piece of crap like this. You can tell it's a wafer lock, which, well, it's hard to see in this lighting, but instead of seeing pins, 
you see this flat pieces of, of uh, metal in there, which I need better lighting for you to actually be able to see well. But let me take this thing apart and show you what I mean by wafers getting pulled out of the way. Now this is the inner cylinder, the plug, and you see it has these little wafers. And normally these wafers would lock in to those grooves you see, and you wouldn't be able to turn the lock. However, let me see if I can fold this in the right way, this will work. If you put in the proper key for it, all the wafers should line up and move out of the way. So that it would now be able to turn in the cylinder, no problem. And that's the basics of how a wafer lock works. Usually these you pick by just raking them open, applying a little bit of tension, pulling a raking tool across them, and it usually doesn't take much. Uh, these are usually uh, pretty crappy. Uh, they also, you see, you see a lot of TSA locks, which I'll cover in a bit, hopefully, uh, that also use uh, wafers. Um, this is a pin tumbler lock. Actually, I'm, let's go back to um, a wafer lock again. And let's see if I find it. Oh, yes. I, I like this lock because it has a few interesting features. But even though it's a kind of a crappy lock, I, it, it has some endearing things about it that I find, um, well, I'll just say cute. Um, let me see. I'm trying to find the right tool for this job. I uh, will use you. You and, uh, yeah. This particular one, I can sometimes get into without even using a tension tool. Most, a lot of times in movies, you'll see people only use one tool in the lock. That's not the way jet lock picking generally works. Though strangely with this one, you can sometimes get away with that. This lock is a TSA lock. It's meant for when you travel, the TSA agents don't have to cut your uh, tag, you don't have to cut your locks off. They can use a special set of keys, in this case, a TSA key number seven, and be able to get in and open your lock. Now, the way this one's designed, it has an extra feature that when the TSA agent opens it with the proper key, it pops up this red flag so you know someone's been in it. And then the actual end user normally would use the combination on it. And later on, just like reset it and take it back to normal. So that red flag's supposed to pop up whenever someone picks, oh, sorry, not, doesn't pick, when they use the proper key for it. However, Oh, well, remember I said it sometimes opens even with just a tension tool? Usually these ones have such bad tolerances, and it's a type of wafer lock also. This one is. Not all TSL so wafer locks. It's such bad tolerances. You can pick it super easy, but notice that the red flag does not pop up. I thought those were neat. Anyway, that's an example of a wafer lock. Usually bad tolerances. They're all good wafer locks, but... Back to how a pin tumbler lock works, though. You see a key being inserted into a pin tumbler lock. The way it works is those different cuts in the key match up with the key pins, lift them to the right height, and put the gap between the driver pin and the key pin on the shear line. Then you can turn the inner plug. Now, that's just the basics of pin tumbler lock. Now, when we pick one, we're going to be using imperfections to try to get those driver pins to lock up above the shear line. And I'll show that in a bit. Like here is someone going through, feeling for where a particular pin binds. As you're turning it, you'll notice that one pin is harder to push up than the other. That's the one you want to push up a little further until you feel it release, and you might feel the cylinder turn a little bit. Then you go on to the next one, and so on and so forth. And you see that process of single pin picking in the illustrations at the bottom. Again, all this artwork pretty much comes from Deviant. There's various things people can do to also make a lock harder to pick, like throwing in spool pins, mushroom pins. Um, the way these things work is there's an extra dip in the pin, and when you try to lock it above the shear line, it hangs. So you have to pick it, you feel it hang, it's a false set, you have to release a little tension, push it up again. You put a few spool pins in one, it becomes, uh, well, kind of demonically difficult to open. Uh, so with that, I'm actually going to show a little bit of picking. And I'm also going to pass around a key, sorry, a lock and a key so you can see how one works. Now this one actually has, and it's hard to make it read on, on camera, this one actually has spool pins. And this is the one I'm going to pass around because I'm certainly not going to try to pick it in front of y'all because it's going to take way too long for me. But notice that 
when you don't have any key in it, the driver pins are going below the shear line and you can't turn it. If you put in the wrong key, some of the key pins are going to be in the way and you still can't turn it. But if you put in just the right one, all the pins line up, the gap between the driver pin and the key pin are at the shear line, and you can turn it. Now what I'm going to do is pass this around so people can actually see what that looks like, you know, with the wrong keys and the right keys, and it'll give you an idea for how a lock works. Now the lighting may not be so great up here, but I'm going to try to pick this one. Um, personally, I don't like these for practice because they're kind of, um, well, the feedback on them is not the same as a full-fledged real lock. Also, from y'all's perspective, it's probably going to look like I'm picking this upside down, but it's the way I have to see it to be able to do it. So, applying a little bit of tension, trying to feel for which one binds, and get it to block up above the shear line. What order they're going to bind in varies from lock to lock. Even the locks are the same model number may not necessarily have the same binding order. And right there, all right, if you look at that real carefully, I've tried to lock a few of them above the shear line. It looks like I got most of them, but I don't think I have them perfectly because somebody is not turning. So I got to probe for which one is binding and then lift it just a little bit more. There we go. And now I can turn the lock. That's the basics of picking, basically feeling it, which one binds, and then once that one's out of the way, going through and getting the rest. You photo a few spool pins in one, that makes it so much more difficult. Since it's going to take a while for this to get around, actually I don't have extra keys for it, so I guess handing this one around won't help since without seeing the key it doesn't help as much. But this gives you a good visual illustration when you play with that lock I'm passing around. Um, usually though, most times I don't actually single pin pick anything, I'm not real good at single pin picking. I rake a lot of them. Raking essentially is instead of trying to each fill out each individual pin, you take, well you saw what I did with the master lock earlier with the two Bogotas. That's essentially raking. Some people would make a subtle distinction that it's jiggling or rocking, but I think that's splitting hairs. Essentially you're manipulating a bunch of pins at the same time, trying random combinations essentially to try to get the lock open. Now a question a lot of people ask is which way do I turn the lock? There's some general rules on this. If the bolt, if it's a dead bolt, and the bolt is on your left, you turn it clockwise to retract the bolt. If it's on your right, counterclockwise. Now for blue collared master locks, like um, this one right here, this is a old master lock number three, these you can generally pick in either direction, so it doesn't matter which way you turn it. Um, mailbox locks, generally counterclockwise. Doorknobs, any which way. There was a, uh, in Vegas there was a door we were trying to pick and none of us could do it, then one guy finally picked it, but he couldn't make the, the bolt turn because he was picking it, well, bolts on left, clockwise to, to pick it. We picked it, but he couldn't operate it because that was the wrong way to go. That one was actually counterclockwise, so sometimes doorknobs are completely different. There's actually a tool called a plug spinner that some locks are just easier to pick backwards than they are the way they're supposed to be picked to actually operate the mechanisms. So you can pick it backwards and then use a plug spinner, stick it in the lock, hit a button, and it has, it's spring-loaded so it turns the uh, cylinder so fast that the pins don't get a chance to fall down. And you can get in. There's actually a bunch of uh, Master Lock M1s uh, like that, and the M5s. Why? I'm not quite sure. When in doubt, though, uh, turn clockwise is probably best. I don't have exact statistics for that, but that seems to work the best for me most of the time. Now, um, there's also other ways of picking. Remember how I mentioned most of the time in lock picking, we want to lift just the driver pin above the shear line. In this case, that blue pin. But some locks have so much room up in what's called the Bible of the lock, where all the pins retract into, that you can actually push up everything up into the, the Bible of the lock and still be able to turn it. That's a type of overlifting attack, and you do that with comb picks. Now, here is an example of a comb pick. Let's see if I got it in, underneath there. Looks like a little comb. Got my lock here. So it looks better for you all. You know what? Actually, so it looks the same for both of us. Let's do this. This might be better. And hopefully I can stay on camera while I'm doing it. 
Okay. So, see up in the Bible lock, there's a lot of room. The springs aren't very strong. And I got to figure out, figure out the right comb pick to put in it to actually be able to lift them. So one of these is the right gauge for that. So let me lock it. If I have the key for that model, or if I've opened that model of lock before, or if I feel around and say, okay, that feels right. It, there's no absolute way, and sometimes you can get a comb pick stuck in a lock if you use the wrong one. So I, I got a, a comb pick in there. I think I chose the right gauge, but maybe not. I'm going to double check that gauge. Yeah, it looks close. All right. Get that in there. Press up. I lifted all the pins above the shear line. Hopefully I've got that in the camera right. And if you get that lined up right, hopefully you'll be able to turn the cylinder and operate the lock. Well, they're all, all lifted. Now this is the um, comb pick, uh, a comb pick that uh, Seven specially sells. But I'm having problems getting it to work precisely. Well, you see, the idea is to get everything lifted above the shear line. Whoa, actually, I think I just felt a turn. Actually, let me see if I can hold, if I hold it up properly, see if I can get it to line up. There we go. <laughs> it's hard to hold it where y'all can see it and do it at the same time. But since all I was doing was lifting up all the pins above the shear line, so I could turn it. And that's comb picking. Now, that's a uh, Chinese lock I use for uh, demoing. However, you're not going to count that one in the United States very much. Um, however, there are also types of um, master lock you wouldn't count a lot. They're solid bodied. And they have so much room in the Bible, you can essentially do the exact same attack. Like, um, how many people have a lock that looks like this? And you might see another one that looks exactly the same shape, but it's made out of all brass. The problem with these is they have that same issue where there's so much room up in the Bible to lock, you can do an overlifting attack and open them real fast. There was a contest um, at Gurkhan I lost because I wasn't able to pick one of these, but I could pick the lock no one else could. Everybody else picked this one, and so we tied and we had to go into another round. If I had comb picks with me, I could have got that. Sometimes those are a little bit difficult, at least for me, but with comb picks, no problem. There's other types of attacks people can do. They can do impressioning attacks where they put in a very soft brass key, wiggle it back and forth from the lock, look for where little indentions, little um, Friction marks are made on the key, file it down with a Pippin file, and then just keep repeating until they have exact duplicate of the original key. Well, close enough duplicate. Uh, there's also master keying, where um, people put extra wafers so that you have one key that might open all the locks in the building, but a different key to only open, like, just say, just your office door. And they sometimes do that, there's different ways, but do that by putting little extra wafers in the lock to um, have different key depths at which the two things will actually turn. Sometimes this actually makes it easier to pick or rake because you have different combinations, that, more possible combinations that will actually open that particular lock. Um, there's other types of pin and tumbler locks though that aren't oriented like we normally see with a vertical stack. For instance, there are um, tubular locks. Like this is a tubular lock and it has pins oriented in a circle. But the principle is still the same. Um, you all have the key out there, so I can't show you. Where is it right now? Okay. Um, actually, I'm going to show it real quick, and then I'm going to hand it back. You keep the key. You keep the lock. Um, essentially, it works the exact same, but it's just the pins are oriented in a different way. And they actually make tubular lock picks that you can use to do a self-impressioning kind of thing. Well, you push them in, you wiggle them, and it slowly starts indenting these little needles to where you eventually get the actual key reproduced. Then you can measure the depths and get the key reproduced by number. Um, another type of pin tumbler lock you encounter sometimes oh, 
is a, a dimple lock. On a dimple lock, it's the sides of the key that actually have the indentations. But it's still a pin tumbler lock. That's a tubular lock pick, for instance. I have one around here. Mixed luck sometimes getting it to work, but um, I have one in my kit if anybody actually wants to play with it later. There was a while back, uh, I think it was, I remember saying the late 90s, there was a bike lock company, Kryptonite, and um, they produced a bunch of uh, bike locks that could be picked by using a big pin. Basically, you take the big pin, shove it in the lock, wiggle it, and it would do a self-impressioning onto the, the, onto the big pin, and you'd eventually be able to open the lock. My understanding is the original, earlier version of the Kryptonite lock did not have this problem, and now later ones do not have the problem. It was only during a brief time period. And the reason for that is someone ordered the cheapest part that they could from China. And um, uh, a guy named uh, Skyler Town is actually trying to figure out in um, various records to figure out who the person that actually made that order, that purchase decision. Uh, this is an example of the dimple lock I was referring to before. Notice how the pins on the sides, or the keys, are, it's on the sides that where you actually have the little divots. You can still pick those. Generally what I do if I don't have a dimple specific picks, is I'll put a little tension on it, take the flat side or the pick, and just kind of um, wiggle it in there. And some of them are not too hard to pick because you usually have less possible key depths. It's not as aggressive of pinning because it doesn't have as much room to move around. Um, but there are also picks made especially for dimple locks. Then those weird boys like um, this detainer locks. This one I have a pick for. I'm not reliable, particularly reliable at getting it to work. The way these work, is you have what well, a combination lock. You have a bunch of um, discs in them, and they ought to be lay aligned to the right angle. When that happens, this little sidebar will fall out of the way and allow the cylinder to turn. And I have an example of one of those, and hopefully I can find the key for it as well. I actually have a chain of demo locks I carry around just for illustrating how um, some different types of lock work. Let me see. That's a chain of uh... Yes, I do go through airport security sometimes with a chain full of locks and no, no one says anything. Let's uh, see. Should be... Oh, here it is. Yeah, this is a cheap Chinese disc detainer lock. Um... don't have time to actually pick it and I wouldn't be that reliable with it anyway. But the key for it looks something like this. There's little angles cut in it and it aligns those discs inside the lock. A sideball falls out of the way and then these ball bearings can fall out of the way. And the ball bearings make this a little bit better lock because you can't shim it, which I'll try to show in a bit. So this isn't the proper key because it's not aligning the discs all right. Um, so let me try one of the other keys on here that's also, let me see, where is that? Should have one on here. Those all look the same. Okay, at one time I had the proper key for this on this chain. I'm pretty sure, and I can't fathom why I would take it off of here. Oh, here it is. Yeah. So... It's got all the right angles cut in it. And so when it lines up, the sidebar falls all the way, you can turn the cylinder, and then the ball bearings can move out of the way. Another thing about these is you pick them, you can tell someone's picked it because your key won't go in smoothly afterwards. Right now, since I used the proper key, my key goes in fairly smoothly. If I just picked it, all the gates would be misaligned, and um, you'll get a good feel that, oh, someone's probably been inside this lock. See how much time I got. Got a little bit of time. All right. That brings me to other types of um, ways of getting into a lock besides picking and raking them. Those bump keys. A bump key basically works. I've heard people say it works on the principle of like a Newton's cradle where you pull back a ball and it bounce, 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 bounce. The idea is you hit the key pin. It throws everything up into the um, Bible. The key pins fall down first. The driver pins are still up there for a moment, and you can turn it. I've also heard it referred to as just creating chaos in the lock. This is the way uh, Skylo refers to it. Um, I'm not sure what the most proper thing from a physics standpoint is, and I'm not exactly going to do this on camera because I can't 
hold the thing, well, not on this camera. I can't exactly hold the thing and bump at the same time. But the idea is you have a key that has been taken down to the lowest depths, and when you put that in and bump it, that is, you hit each pin, and I'm pulling out one spot. You hit each pin, and at the same time, bounces everything up into the Bible of the lock, and if anything happens right, for a brief moment, the lock cylinder can be turned. Now, I use this particular one for practicing, because those other ones, I'd be pounding on it for hours before it actually works. But this particular mass lock, I know, is good for these demos, which is why I should probably put that on my demo chain. Uh, <laughs> So I know for future reference. But that's simple lock bumping. There's also more automated ways of doing essentially the same thing. Wait a second. Like those pick guns. And that's what this is. Essentially it works on the same principle as lock bumping, except for you're using electronic means. So it's got a little motor in there. This thing can also double as a drill if I change the head on it. And you're essentially just bouncing the pins up and down, causing chaos, and eventually, hopefully, things match up in such a way that you can turn it. So let me see if I can get my tension tool in there. This may or may not work well. Let's see. It basically bounces those pins around. Eventually, they all meet up at the shear line, and you can turn it. Nifty stuff. And... I think this lock has been used way too much because it's getting really beaten up. Oh, That's like a $50 toy from uh, China. There's also shimming a lock. Now, I can't do this with one of ball bearings, but I can do it on a lot of uh, locks. And the way shimming a lock works is... Well, I mentioned locking dogs before. Um, if you look at this lock, you'll notice these little... Uh, locking dogs, well, the lighting may not be good, that fit into these grooves in the shackle. The idea behind shimming is we're pushing something in and moving those out of the way so we can open the lock. If um, I was to show that visually, let's see, that one's pretty beat up, but I think it'll hopefully work for this demo. These are kind of disposable items. Eventually, they do break. Find me a couple good ones there. Yeah, whoops. These are professionally made shims. I've also made some myself out of um, that really tough uh, neo meat, uh, na sorry, nano meat uh, plastic before. People a lot of times make them out of uh, tin cans and such. But um, personally, I like professionally made ones just because they're nice and sturdy. I don't have to worry about cutting myself as much when trying to make one myself out of a tin can. But the way these work is you have your lock, and you're trying to push those locking dogs aside. So these little butterfly shims, you put them on each side of the lock, and you try to turn them in to push the uh, locking dog aside. Right now, I'm not even feeling it being in there. Huh. Okay, let me see. What's the other one? All right, let me uh, try this again. This one here. Turn it. Get that. Get that uh, locking dog out of the way. Oh, shoot. I'm going to have to do this standing up because it's hard for me to bend over and do it. And... I think I just bent this one to the point where it may no longer function. Well, eventually you give them the pop. Would have been faster if this one hadn't been essentially shredded by now. So I'm going to throw this one away. They're kind of disposable items. Eventually you're going to break them. Um, I have one that I made out of plastic that I've also gotten to work before. But just a really, really tough plastic. Let me see. Uh, there's also loiting. I showed a little bit of that before. I have a specially made card like this I use sometimes for pulling a latch aside. The reason for this is, and I need a better picture of this, a lot of people don't hang the door right. There's this little button that's supposed to come in on a latch to keep it from depressing. 
uh, if it's been closed until the key is actually used on the outside. A lot of people don't hang the door right, and you can load your way in. And I'm very short on time. Another uh, trick is shivs. There's sometimes some of these you can actually use bypass tools on to get into them. What is? Okay, I saw a weird thing on my screen. Yeah, it shows up there too. Okay, the way these work is um, you're reaching into the lock and you're manipulating the locking dogs from outside. You're not really messing with the pins directly. You're uh, messing with the locking dogs. So you reach in, and if you see that little locking dog right there, see I'm pulling it aside, the one on the top? That's the way some of these little bypasses work. And um, these ones specifically were designed for master locks, where you'd um, reach in. But these were the master switch from uh, Sparrows. Peterson uh, Manufacturing also makes one. They call this the silver bullet. But uh, falls into a hold at the top. Okay, another one falls in the hole at the bottom. Wiggle it and pops the lock. Uh, I found though, uh, Brinks locks are generally more secure, but they make a particular part one that you can do a lot of the same thing with the same tool. Just reach in and you got to figure the right spot to touch, but get it to pop real easy. Um, there's all sorts of ones that have uh, flaws where you can open this way. But that's also, again, for ones that use um, uh, locking dogs and not ball bearings. Let's see, there's also like bypass drivers. Like this is an American padlock that was a U.S. military issue, uh, I think sometime in the 90s. It's actually a really hard lock to pit, but there's a flaw in how it lines up. If you looked at the back of it, there's a cam that is aligned like this with the keyway. And you can reach a tool in there and turn it. Now some other padlocks, like some of my uh, master ones that are rekeyable that I, I have back there on the chain, um, they are oriented in such a way that you can't actually turn it with one of these tools. But let me show you how this tool works. Essentially, it's golf club shaped, and you put it into the lock upside down. A second. And like I said, again, this is a hard one to pick. It's got like serrated pins, I think maybe some spool pins. It picks a bit to pick. But with a tool like this, because it doesn't shield it, the back of the lock, you can reach to the back of the lock, turn it, and pop the shackle. Now, they started um, issuing little discs to put in here to keep you from being able to reach all the way to the back. Then I think Peterson released a wafer breaker, which you could put in the lock, pound it, break that wafer, and then still use the tool. I think most modern ones, maybe they, they uh, integrate it completely in the cylinder so you can't use a tool like this. But that's an easy way to get into that type of American lock if you have one of these bypass tools. And let me see. Look at how much time I got. Oh, there's also under the door tools. I have one back there. Uh, essentially what you do is you reach underneath the door and these ADA compliant doors that have the little level handles. You reach under the door, you grab the other side of it with the under the door tool. These are also something that's called mules. You grab a hold of that handle, pull it down, and get right in. You can buy them online, but um, you can also make them. And I have an improvised one back there. And handcuffs, I don't really have time for handcuffs. Um, don't pick handcuffs generally unless you can do it with improvised items. If you're carrying around uh, lock picks, you can probably carry around a handcuff key too. Uh, but there's ways of getting around these, which I don't have a whole lot of time to cover. Basically involves shimming it to get this uh, ratcheting system out of the way. And I have a transparent one around here that we can take a look at later on in, during the break or during lunch, if you want to see how those work. Well, links for more information, and uh, well, you'll be able to get these slides from me if you want. Uh, LockWiki has a lot of good information about lock picking in general. Bloomington Fools as well. Skylar Town does a lot of research on lock history. He talks about lock the same some the way some men talk about their wives, assuming they like their wives. Uh, Reddit has a good uh, subreddit on lock picking. Tool US has a lot of information, and if you do a Google search for Iron Geek and lock picking, I got my own stuff. Just a quick plug for DerbyCon coming up September 25th, 3rd for the 27th. Um, I think tickets go on sale maybe this weekend, May 1st. Uh, though you might have a hard time finding hotel space at this point. And finally, are there any questions which I don't have time for because I gotta get the next speaker up? So ask questions as I pack all my gear up and get it out of the next speaker's way. Any questions? I know that was a mile a minute coverage of locks and lock bypass. Yes.
Well, I've seen it referred to as a mica sheet also. It's something that's sold by some locksmith suppliers. I ordered mine from DHgate in China. They call it a, na uh, it looks like nanometer, but they take off one of the letters. So it looks like it's been pronounced nanomeat. But, uh, sure, I, I got one with me, I believe, in my backpack. You know what? It sounds like something you can probably do. I haven't personally looked into it, but I mean, I suppose you'd have to be able to get some information if you had enough of them. Any other questions? Well, in that case, thank you for your time, and um, hopefully the next week can come on up.